So, tell me more about your family. Dr. Shanton crossed his legs and smiled politely. We are very happy and normal, Dad lied, because he really wanted to be chosen for the stupid study. My kids are the best. Never give me any trouble. He made us wear our good clothes. George even had a ridiculous boy suit on, you know, with shorts instead of pants. I remember walking through the beautiful and long white marble corridors that led to the interview room and how dad had threatened us to have awful things happen at home if we didn't behave properly. That if we still have a home, mom muttered in an unpleasant tone, her mouth in a fine line, your dad can't find another job. I always knew that our family was very far from happy and normal, but lately, memories have been flooding back. Memories from my childhood. There's no way I'll ever remember Karina, but I remember finding a note among my mother's belongings when I discovered I was a girl and hence absolutely had to use my mother's makeup. At the time, I thought nothing of it. It was a scrambled old paper and my dad's unmistakable ugly calligraphy. I'm sorry, Sandra, but that baby had something evil. As far as I can remember, George always had a scary imaginary friend. According to him, it was a brown bear with huge jaws that lived in the closet and protected him from the monsters. As his older sister, I thought it was cute, his way to cope with fear of the dark. He was being a brave boy. Dr. Shanton asked a lot about our extended family. Now I know that his team wanted to make sure we wouldn't be missed. Both our parents unfortunately passed, my mother answered, simply. I never met dad's parents, but I remembered my other grandmother faintly. Grandma Ada Green, my mother's mom. She died after spending a few days at our house. I was around six, but I can remember that week clearly now. I remember it so clearly my head hurts. I can almost smell the bitter coffee mom made her when she was at our house. Our parents put George's bed in my room, because we didn't have a spare bedroom for guests. Grandma Ada stayed at the young boy's bedroom, all painted cerulean. It was the only room in the house that had a walk-in closet. She died after falling from the stairs and snapping her neck. I never saw her body or knew how she really passed until I read the necropsy report years later. <laughs> I was always a curious brat. Grandma was already too old and frail so her death was considered accidental. Since my mother, her only daughter, inherited nothing but debits, there was no reason to suspect foul play. Does your family have some kind of secret, Regis? Dr. Shanton asked jovially. Once you're there being monitored, we'll find out anyway, so you'd better tell me now. I really liked Dr. Shanton from the moment I saw him. I met all the other scientists, and they were cold. Almost rude? When I came up with my plan to escape, I prayed that it was Dr. Shanton on watch. No, sir. No secrets. Dad responded abruptly. My mother frowned so hard, she looked 90 years old. We had a child that didn't make it, she added. But it was a long time ago. And those things happen. Right, doctor? Of course, madam. I'm sorry for your loss. Dr. Shanton was proper in his response, but... Now, I can tell he was eager to know more about Karina. He just had this look. David looked at me the same way when his brother revealed the suicide letter. No incidents of that sort happened for years after Grandma's death, but Dr. Shanton had too much interest in my dead sister. I think that's what brought her back. <laughs> and yes, it's irrational, but I think the thing in the closet is partially George's imaginary bear friend and partially Karina. It was our fifth family member, and it followed us to our new house inside the facility. My dad wasn't a good man, but I'm inclined to believe that he killed his baby daughter on purpose, because he saw her as a twisted and demonic child. Sure, maybe he was mentally ill, but maybe not. I know that'll sound ridiculous to you, but I never told anyone about the whisperings I heard coming from George's bedroom when we moved to the facility at the start of the experiment. On day two, I woke up screaming. I told myself I was having a nightmare, but I know I wasn't. I could hear it clearly. It was a voice like none I'd ever heard. A grave voice, mixed to a child's voice. 
like a lot of different voices were one and the same. I hate Dad. Why would he kill me? I wanted to protect George, but now I hate him. If only one of us could live, it should be me. Besides, when the assistants tried to remove Dad's body, they found the closet completely empty. After I escaped, I wanted to live a normal life as soon as possible. <laughs> I got myself a retail job, which didn't require a background check, and worked my ass off on double shifts to finally earn real money and buy myself basic stuff. I visited a childhood friend that luckily still lived in the same address. Everybody at school and people that knew us thought we had simply moved to another state, and when I told her I had a few problems, she insisted I stayed with her until I found a proper place for myself. My friend was very discreet and never asked me about what happened. Soon, I was able to pay for my own rent and moved to an apartment shared with a few other girls. I reported my legal documents as stolen, and after proving that I was, in fact, Maya Smith, finally, I could get my identity back. I saw no point in trying to change my name. It would only rise suspicious about me. I opted for altering my hair and a few aspects of my face and simply leading a quiet life. I was able to locate George and finally allow the hospital to put him out of his misery. I was sad when I learned of Dr. Shanton's suicide, but I thought that maybe now, with two casualties in the team and all the other subjects dead, they would leave me alone as long as I didn't spill the beans. I was right. I had learned a lot of useful skills during my time in the facility, which gave me the confidence to apply for better qualified jobs. Mere few months after my escape, I got a really nice job as a bilingual front desk clerk at a local hotel. I'm still in this job, but I've been promoted. And that's how I met David. He was organizing a bachelor party for a friend, and I was to help him because he had a German friend coming. David was insanely attractive and had kind eyes. Eager to finally live my life, I'd been dating here and there, but it's nothing serious. He was the first and only person I fell in love with. When I saw David's reservation at the hotel restaurant, my heart skipped a beat. Shanton is not a common last name, so I knew he was somewhat related to Dr. Shanton, the man I owed my life to. I considered it a fun trick of destiny and decided to get closer to David. Not because he was a Shanton, but because I couldn't take my eyes off of him and his family tree sounded like a good omen. I've read all your comments regarding the letter, and I want to thank every single one of you for rooting for me and worrying about my well-being. David can't keep secrets from me, and I didn't talk about my past with him for obvious reasons, but when Saul revealed Dr. Shanton's secret, it was time. Everything is fine. We're happily married for years, and for those who asked, <laughs> we don't have kids yet, because I want to take this part slow, but I adore Saul's sons and probably someday will feel ready to be a mother. The experiment wasn't that bad for me. <laughs> the only thing that pissed me off was that my dad signed a specific clause that didn't unbind me, or George, in case he was alive, from the contract even when we hit 18 years old. Sure, the deaths of my family were very hurtful, but I'm not traumatized enough that I can't function as a proper human being anymore. I know a lot of people went through worse than I did, and the only rational thing I can do is live a good life. I think my parents went crazy from the isolation because they considered themselves to be captives and the researchers to be enemies, and more importantly, because they both hated being alone with themselves. I never saw it this way. That was my current living situation, and I should make the best of it. <sighs> sure. Sometimes I freaked out and repeated the same thing 103 times until I got it out of my system and felt mentally stable again, but that was it. It's normal to vent. Most of the time, I always hoped to bore the researchers to death and be released, and that's one of the things that kept me sane. I was looking forward to a future. Poor George was scared and probably haunted. Mom was always weak-willed and Dad spiraled in his madness. None of them could see a future. None of them could do it even before we were isolated, if I had to guess. Reading Dr. Shanton's suicide letter, I noticed how I was depicted as a cold teenager at first, but he grew to admire me. Truth is, I don't consider myself to be cold. 
but I don't miss my parents all that much. They weren't great people, and I did my best to tolerate them and keep them alive. But I really miss George. He was a sweet boy, and I'm glad you guys noticed that too. I'm happy that he can be remembered that way by so many people. I hope that I was able to fill a few gaps left by Dr. Shanton's letter with my account of the events. I just have one last thing to tell you. Something I try not to think about. And something I've never told my husband. Sometimes I hear scratches on our closet door. And I swear I can listen to Dr. Shanton's voice. He's screaming and begging. Whenever I approach the closet, the sound stops. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you all thank you so much for listening to tonight's story, or watching tonight's story if you're on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, that means you're probably on the podcast that's available on iTunes, on the Google Play Store, and is now actually available on Spotify and doesn't use as much data. So, hey, that's a thing. If you guys aren't listening on YouTube or Spotify, then I have no idea how else you could have found me. Unless you found one of those books on Amazon. You know, the Creepypasta Collection, Volume 1, Volume 2. Those are things, too. Oh, well. I don't know how you would have heard me there, seeing as this was recorded, like, two years after those came out. Uh. Well, anyway. Thanks for listening, folks. And sweet dreams.